Hi, this is Dan Kleppner, Emeritus Professor at MIT, recently returned from California to Lexington. Congratulations. And um, uh, I'm going to be talking about a character I got interested in some years ago. I have a little prelude to the talk about an incident which took place in 1785. Actually, that was preceded by another incident which took place in 1743 in Philadelphia when Benjamin Franklin formed the American Philosophical Society. It's a group really pretty much like this group of just people who had mutual interests and got together and talked. And it was very popular and really flourished. In uh, 1781, the American, uh, the American Association, for American uh, Academy for Arts and Sciences was started in Boston really as a uh, attempt to catch up with Philadelphia, which had become the cultural center. And John Adams was the uh, founder of it. And he happened to be the president of it in 1785. Excuse me for just a second, because um, can we, can we turn off on my screen the, the little vignettes because they block the um, they block the screen? Don't show. They don't show on our screens. Dan, uh, just 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 take it and drag it with the mouse someplace out of the way for you. Okay. You Thank you. All right. So, it's seventeen eighty five. Actually, Adams is going to become the vice president the following year. But um, as president, he received a letter from abroad. It was a offer of a major endowment, which is very unusual. People didn't give endowments to uh, academies at that time, but this is a large one. But it did have a small string attached to it. The string was that the first prize must be for heat and light. Now, there was only one person in North America who studied heat and light, and th that was Benjamin Thompson, who was the donor of the prize. So there was a clear conflict of interest there. In those days, presidents were very particular about conflicts of interest, and John Adams simply refused it. At the same time, the, uh, the donor offered a prize to the Royal Society in England, and they accepted it. They had some excuse. They had previously given this guy, who is now called uh, Count Rumford, a prize for work that he did because he had done great service to the nation. So this little incident, though, really illustrates the qualities of personality of Rumford. He was a benefactor. He was benefacting science and society and himself at the same time. And um, th that characterized his whole career. And uh, that's why he's really not known better because he was so f aggrandizing. Anyway, I learned about him when I went to uh, MIT in the mid 60s and there was a professor of plasma physics in the department, Sandy Brown, who was a member of the academy and who was working on compiling the papers of Count Rumford and told me about him. And uh, the, the guy was so interesting, I have learned more about him subsequently. So this is the title of the talk, Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford. Okay. So let me get back to him. As a youth, he was born in Woburn. And the first conspicuous thing about him was that he was educated. He, he was born in a farming family, which most families were in those days. And children did not need to go to school. They just needed to learn how to farm and become, you know, helpers on the farm. But he was quite bright. And so the family sent him to a minister in a nearby town to be educated. 
So he was educated. I don't know all about what he was educated in, but somewhere in there he learned science. He had a During that period, he learned about science from Harvard University. He walked from Woburn to Cambridge, which is nine miles, to hear lectures in, at, at Harvard. So he picked up uh, some real science then. And at the age of 17, he went to Boston and started working in a, either a customs house or accounting house or some mercantile job. At the age of 19, he went to Rumford, New Hampshire as a teacher. In those days, of course, there was no public education. A group of people would get together and hire a tutor and he took that job um, and walked to New Hampshire to take it and apparently did pretty well because at the age of 21, which is sort of the technically end of youth, he is the wealthiest man in New Hampshire. And anyone care to hazard how he got that to be the wealthiest man in New Hampshire? Got to be real estate, doesn't it? No. He married the wealthiest widow in New Hampshire. And so uh, immediately had uh, access to her fortune and to her social class. So he went from being a um, sort of an untutored rough youth to moving in the highest circles in New Hampshire society, which was the society of the um, governor of New Hampshire. Of course, all the colonies had the colonial governors, generally generals, and uh, they became very good friends and he thrived in that atmosphere. Oh yes, here is the map of how he walked from Woburn to Cambridge um, when he was taking his lectures at Harvard. So he led a life of leisure in the upper crust there. He developed a real interest in heat and light at that point and started working on the design of fireplaces and eventually became a real, the leading expert on that design. But he was very interested in horticulture too. He was a neighbor of Naomi Baldwin and helped Baldwin propagate the Baldwin apples but he was interested in all sorts of agriculture all his life. He was also interested in surveying. He liked, he liked it because it's a, it's a fun thing for scientists to do when there's interesting places to survey. And he got the uh, governor so en enthusiastic about that that he commissioned to um, he commissioned Thompson to survey the White Mountains, and the governor said he himself would participate in the surveying, and would allow three whole weeks to surveying New Hampshire. Well, that that fell through. He was also uh, a friend of Governor Gage, in, in, um, who was occupying Boston at the time. As a wealthy landowner, he was particularly interested in, in preventing civic disobedience. There was a rumblings of the, concept of the revolution were taking place then, and he was very much uh, afraid of what this might do to his land holdings. The situation isn't that different from what it was today. Um, he made, a, he made a, a deal with the governor of uh, Boston to be friends and his part of the friendship was to encourage deserters to go back to 
their base and they would be forgiven. That was a very difficult problem, both for the army and the navy at the time. Desertion was a major uh, loss of troops. And the reason was it was so easy to desert. If you just go off a few miles, no one can ever find you. And so a lot of the deserters were working on farms around there. And um, uh, Rumford spread the word. He encouraged them just by t telling them, look, go back, you'll be forgiven. And um, that made him rather unpopular with the neighbors. So rumors started floating that, uh, th that Rumford was not a real patriot. And one afternoon he got word that he was going to be tarred and feathered that evening. Tarring and feathering was done in those days. It was a very cruel uh, punishment. And Rumford immediately took action. What he did was get on a horse and ride to Boston. Didn't take anything with him. He just got there and somehow established himself in Boston. He joined the Sons of Liberty, which was a Patriots group. And they were very pleased to have him because he knew so much about the countryside and the people just from having hobnob with the elites for several years. So he went to their weekly meetings, but they started getting suspicious of him. They thought that he might be spying for the British. So he joined the Sons of Liberty and he leaves abruptly. He fled to England and he fled leaving a little note for his father-in-law. That was just, well, that's just the trip to, to Boston. Anyway, the letter exists, farewell from Rumford to his father-in-law. This is in 1775. And let me just read it, although you can see it. I am determined to seek for that peace and protection in foreign lands and among strangers, which is denied me in my native country. I cannot any longer bear the insults that are daily offered me. I cannot bear to be looked upon and treated as an akin of society. I have done nothing that can deserve this cruel usage. I have done nothing with any design to injure my countrymen and cannot any longer bear to be treated in this barbarous manner by them. And then there was a little postscript to his father. P.S. Take care of my wife and daughter. And he left and he got on a ship and went to England. So there he had gone from, from rags to riches and back to rags because he got to England with virtually nothing with him except some scientific skill and um, a, a great entrepreneurial ambition. He contacted the, the uh, commander of the Navy and offered to do some research for them. And here is a, a, a picture of his, oh yes, I must put in, after I learned about Rumford, I learned about this book on his papers, which had been moldering away in the uh, archives of the uh, British uh, Foreign Office. And what this is, is a spy letter from Rumford to General Gage with information in invisible ink. There were suspicions that Rumford had been spying clearly, and this was actual evidence that he really was a, uh, a spy in spite of his powerful rhetoric. Anyway, he went to work on a very important military problem, which was the motive power of gunpowder explosions or the speed of rifle bullets. And he undertook to measure it there is lots of, um, uh, uh, what should we say, folk knowledge about how much powder you should put in a gun and how it should be treated. Some people felt that putting in a little moisture made it explosive, more explosive and things like that. He actually did experiments. And you'll recognize this if you've taken any elementary physics as a ballistic pendulum. The 
rifle is over there on the right and the drum over there on the left is a it's a large wooden mass and simply by firing the bullet into the mass and seeing how far it recoils you can you can uh and if you know the mass of the bullet and the mass of the drum you can calculate what the speed of the bullet was it's a standard technique but it was new at the time he didn't invent the ballistic pendulum, someone else did, but no one had used it for anything before. He had a very clever way to measure the recoil of the block on the left. You see that little rope hanging over the edge. Well, it was attached to the block and as the block swung, it would pull up the rope. And by measuring how, mu how much the rope got pulled up, he could tell how far the swing was. So that was the apparatus he used. And this is a page of data that was published in the Royal Society. And it shows that he really was quite a good scientist. And uh, uh, I'm sure you can't really read it from there. But on, on the left are results from, ver from firing various weights of gunpowder in the bullet in grains. And next to it, how far the recoil was. And on the far right, it lists what the speeds were. So he, repeat, he repeated the experiments. So they really were quite credible. And he did it under various conditions. And this was considered, you know, top secret knowledge for the Navy. They had a new secret weapon for their most powerful and, and most uh, commonly used instruments of war, namely cannons on ships. So that kind of got him established in British society and he flourished there. He used his knowledge of fireplaces to improve the situation in London. What was the problem? Well, in those years, London was a horrible place to live in. It was always covered with a thick black cloud of soot. And Rumford studied this and realized this was unburned carbon, which was floating up. Not only was it causing a huge you know, damage, cutting off the sunlight and making everything filthy, but it was a, a very poor way to use the coal. You were losing a lot of it. And he went to work on the fireplace to try to make them better. So his basic problem was that life in London was intolerable. So here are some of his fireplace designs. On the left, well, figure one is a cross section of what fireplaces were in those days. They were just square boxes with a tube going straight up. On the right, is the fireplace that he developed. You probably recognize it because it has sloped sides on either side. And that was, um, th that was just one of the innovations. A major innovation was in the chimney design. Up in the, on the top left is what chimneys look like in his time. On the right, it shows the Rumford design. There is a damper in it and a narrow throat. So the hot air has to go up to that throat. The damper can be used just to cut the chimney off altogether. So you don't have cold air coming down when it's not used. Behind that throat, there's what we call the smoke shelf. If you have, if you use the fireplace, you'll recognize this design. <clears throat> The, I, the problem was that the chimney smoke was um, uh, chaotic, that they blew back often and fl flew out into the room and it was very hard to make them draw. And the reason they didn't draw was because of turbulence in the chimney. And with the smoke shelf that was very much reduced, you actually had a counterflow in the chimney with cold air on the right sinking and then warm air on the left going up. So that 
chimney was much more efficient and pleasant to live with. On the right is a chimney made for a very small uh, fire in a room rather than a large fire, but it's the same idea um, with a little fire pot in the center with the radiating sides right next to it. So that was the Rumford fireplace design and it was very popular. Here is a cartoon of a young lady warming her fanny on a Rumford fireplace. So we became something of a um, social mm, celebrity. I just wanted to show a contemporary fireplace. This is a commercial design. Um, it, it, it lists some, yeah, superior clay Rumford throat. Rumford's design was so well done that if you write to the Bureau of Agriculture for fireplace design, they send you Rumford's designs. I mean, he looked at all of this very carefully. A particularly important feature is the ratio of the opening in the front to the size of the chimney. And Rumford got it right, and his measurements are still being used. Oh yes, uh, Franklin also worked on fireplace design some years earlier. Franklin realized that uh, the fireplaces bring in cold air from the outside and uh, he installed a pipe in the lower left. Um, that's a tube leading outdoors which brings in cold air which then gets heated and uh, with this kind of reheating device and goes up the chimney. It never really worked that well. That's one area in which uh, Rumford's technology exceeded Franklin's. Franklin was really a great scientist and uh, so you can forgive him for flubbing up a little bit on this one design. Anyway, here he is at age 30 in London. Uh, he has the, um, the dress of an officer because he'd been given a commission. He was popular enough and made enough money so he became a commissioned officer and this is at the age of 30, a very good looking chap. To Rumfordize London, he installed his stoves in, anyone who had the money to install it in their room. He did a couple of other things too. He put in um, cushions below the floor uh, the, at the bottom of the doors because the doors always swung freely with an inch or two of clearance. And he realized that all this was doing was to bring in uh, cold air from the outside and you wanted to limit the cold air coming in. So sealing the, sealing the entrances, the doors and windows and installing the Rumford fireplace was called Rumfordizing. And uh, London went mad for that. Everyone wanted to be Rumfordized and he obliged making a fortune in doing that. So he was the most popular man in town and then he fled. Say for the usual reason, the usual reason was that people got very suspicious of him. There was a famous spy trial in 1781, the Lamotte spy trial, where a French man who'd been living there as a citizen was convicted of being a spy and he was executed in a really barbarous medieval fashion, which is kind of surprising for that date. But there were suspicions that there were others who were dealing with Lamont and that Rumford might be one of them. So he got on a ship and left. He sailed for France. While crossing the channel, he fell into conversation with a fellow passenger who gave him an introduction. By coincidence on the ship, Gibbons, who was at that point writing the fall, the, the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, this masterful work, was on the same ship and his diary, he made comment about meeting a Rumford. And he described him as um, philosopher, mathematician, scientist, uh, and a few other adjectives, 
Rumford. He, he felt contempt for the guy because all he was doing was boasting about himself and being um, very show off, which one can understand that was Rumford's character, but it was enough for Gibbons to make a note in his diary and someone to find it. Anyway, he got a, into conversation with someone who thought Rumford was very interesting and might like to meet his uncle. So he arrived sort of penniless in France, not knowing anyone, but he had one letter of introduction to a chap in Munich. And the chap, his uncle was the the Duke, the, the ruler, the elector of Bavaria. So he had a letter of introduction to the top man and he got into conversation with him and made an agreement. He said, if you make me your quartermaster general and I will make your army happier make your city better, and it won't cost you anything. And uh, the, the elector bit and said, okay, let's try it out. And Rumford succeeded in all of these things. The problems, first of all, the problems for the, the problems were problem, major problems were problems of the army. The army was very cold in the winter time. That the way to deal with uh, th that problem was to make heavier and heavier uniforms. Heavier and heavier meant less and less comfortable, but more and more expensive because of the fabric. At that point, Thompson had measured the thermal conductance of various materials. He realized that cloth is actually a pretty good thermal conductor. He also realized that air was not. And the way to um, uh, the way to keep warm, well, what basically was to use thermal underwear. He invented thermal underwear and with that layered clothing. So you could make uniforms which use much less fabric, which were much warmer. Uh, another problem was food. The problem of food was that the armies in wintertime, when they're not occupied with war, which was most of the time, um, cooked for themselves over little open tripods in the open. And Rumford realized this was obviously a, a very inefficient way to burn your wood. He designed a little enclosed camp stove, which became standard there. So the army could cook much better using much less wood. So that was a great triumph too. Another one, which he solved a bit later was the problem of food there, they didn't have very much to eat in winter. It was very scrappy. Rumford introduced the, really introduced the use of the potato to Europe. The potato was known then, but it, there were very few potato farmers. Rumford realized that when these men were not fighting, they were sitting around and he taught them he made them learn how to farm, grow potatoes. That had two purposes. One is when their enlistments were up, they had a trade. Most of these people had nothing, no skills at all when they left, they could become potato farmers. The other was that the, in learning how to farm potatoes, they farmed potatoes and he fed the army on their potatoes. So that saved a lot of money for the, um, for the Archduke. He also worked on problems of nutrition, which I'll come back to, it was a lifelong interest. There were social issues in the town too. Gin was a, no, a notorious evil. Most poor people were addicted to gin. Begging in the town was an evil too that it was so prevalent that many of the beggars mimed, maimed their youth because, um, you know, it makes them more sympathetic for begging. And they would go where they were not supposed to go. And the general issue of poverty in town and how poor people can live was of concern. And Rumford 
basically improved each one of these. He was a great social reformer as well as a very good scientist. Another was the infrastructure decay, the center of Munich had, uh, was a no man's land. So for the city problem, the gin problem and the beggars and the poor, what he did was to use the army for one day. Every year there was a holiday called the beggar's holiday. And on that holiday, beggars were allowed to go anywhere in the city where generally they were not permitted in many areas. So on the beggar's holiday, he got the army to round up all the beggars, incarcerate them, take them in. And he had them incarcerated in workhouses and put them to work making his uniforms for the army. Now, that isn't as terrible as it sounds because these workhouses were relatively decent places to be in. And at least at work, they got a little bit of money, which they wouldn't otherwise. And it also, of course, got him the army uniforms very cheaply. He was very concerned about the children of Vegas. And what he did was on, in his workhouses, he had seats planted along the walls and the children were incarcerated too and told to sit in the seats. Well, children don't like to sit in seats and in a very short time, they were clamoring to do something else. And he made an agreement with them. He said, okay, we'll let you out of your seats. You can go in with your parents and work on making the uniforms, but only in the mornings. In the afternoons, you have to go to school. So he started educating them. Now, this was not the origin of the public school system, as I understand it, but it was from Munich, and it was a very unconventional way to solve a serious problem. But he realized what it really was as a matter of education. And then there was the question of the general poor in the town and how to take better care of them. Well, he was a serious scientist and he had studied quantitatively speed of uh, heat and light. Here, for instance, at the top is a device for measuring radiant emissivity. What it is, he called it a thermoscope. What it is, it's a giant YouTube with vertical, verticals on each side and a little sphere on the top, a little coated sphere um, and in the middle, at the very bottom, there was a little bubble. Okay. So this was a thermometer, a very sensitive thermometer. If, if a globe got a little bit hotter than the globe on the other side, the bubble would move. And with that, he could me measure the thermal emissivity of many um, different materials. On the right was an emissive, uh, emissivity standard I'm not sure just what was going on in there. I think he was the first person to real, use the candle, the standard candle as the most reproducible source of radiant energy. But that doesn't look like a candle holder to me, but it was described, these are his drawings, um, as an emissiv emissivity standard. Here is an experiment he did. He noted that when ponds freeze, they freeze from the top down. And that's a good thing because if they froze from the bottom up that all living things would not survive the winter. And the question was, why does that occur? And here is an apparatus he designed for studying that. It's clearly, it's an ice bucket with a pail in the middle and a poker at the top which you could heat up and put in. And what you could do would be to start with the water warm and watch as it cools and take temperature measurements in this little cork cup in the center, which was insulated. And it was, and when it cooled, the temperature fell. But at a temperature of four degrees centigrade, it stopped going down, even though the rest of the bucket cooled off. And he, 
he quickly understood what was going on, th that the water gets denser and denser as you cool it until four degrees. And below four degrees, it actually expands a little bit. And it's because of that that the tops of lakes freeze last. So that's a very interesting scientific observation made with a very ingenious um, experiment. The experiment for which he's best known is the cannon boring experiment. As a quartermaster general, he had uh, access to the cannon works there. And he noticed that we, when the, you bored cannons, the bits got very hot. So he made a device, it was a cannon boring device really, but they turned off the bore on it. The bit went around and around, but it didn't protrude, protrude in there. And attached to the device was a thermometer or a box there to measure the temperature of the water. And what happened is, the, well, the water would eventually get up to boiling temperature and it would boil. And as long as you turned, the water boiled. It never stopped boiling. And that was an important discovery because at the time, the, the best theory of heat was Lavoisier's theory of caloric, namely that, uh, that uh, heat is a fluid and that when you, when something gets heats up, the caloric flows out of it. He showed that couldn't be right because the thing heats indefinitely. So he got very interested in that. He actually showed uh, the transfer of heat by radiation using a candle in front of a mirror and a spherical mirror, which focused the image at another point where you had a thermometer. So at one side of the room, you had the candle and the other side, the thermometer, and you could see the thermometer go up. So he uh, immediately recognized that heat was transferred by radiation. Then he extended the experiment by putting a block of ice near the mirror and looked on the other side and he found that the, um, that the temperature fell. So he concluded that heat is one form of radiation and cold is another form of radiation. So he got that one wrong. He called it something like refrigerant cooling. Nonetheless, he clearly understood and was the first person to understand the distinction between radiation, conduction, and um, convection. After designing this stove for the, for the army, he, he and the fireplace, he decided you need to get rid of open hearth cooking. That was the common form of cooking at the time in kitchens and it was very inefficient and very painful. This is a design for one of his uh, fireplaces. It's called a kitchen for a nobleman, a nobleman. The fire is in, in, enclosed and there are dampers on it. So you can control very carefully the amount of heat flowing into the flames. The top of the stove has a lot of open circles to prevent smoke from coming out, the pots had little flanges on the bottom and around the circles, there was a little trough with sand in it. So when you put a top on or a pot on, it was sealed, but under normal conditions, when you're cooking, the bottoms of the pots were directly connected to the, uh, to the fire. He went to work on coffee. Now I mentioned that gin problem was a terrible problem. Um, he looked for alternatives to gin and he thought coffee would be a good alternative. The trouble was that most of the time it tasted terrible. <clears throat> so he went to work on that problem. <clears throat> he heated coffee beans, he distilled the vapors from them and found that the vapors tasted very mildly at lower temperatures, but above boiling temperature, they tasted bitter and terrible. He did this very carefully and found out that the bitter oils actually come out at about 187 degrees Fahrenheit. 
so that the proper way to make uh, coffee is with a um, uh, the water which is slowly slightly below that temperature. In the course of doing this, he invented the drip coffee pot. Um, and the advantage of the drip coffee pot is you can put in water at the top, which is below, at, you know, at the right temperature. He invented a lot of other things for the kitchen. These are some of his designs, various types of flanges. He invented the double boiler. I don't see that picture there. He invented the double boiler, the drip coffee pot. Um, these are designs for tops on pots, which when you boil, don't drip on the floor. Water, the steam comes up and runs down this little flange. That's the little trough on the outside and runs back into the pot. So he really worked very hard and uh, very extensively. Well, the idea was that coffee would become a, a popular drink, and it did. He did not invent the, um, the coffee house. They existed before him, but they got more popular after him. Uh, if, if there were a patron saint of Starbucks, well, they had this kind of um, ethereal woman as their logo. They really should have had Count Rumford as their logo. He was very concerned about how to take care of poor people. He innovated. He learned a lot about, uh, uh, about what makes people feel good in the Winter time, what keeps them warmest is soup. Um, so he worked on soups and invented a stew called Rumford stew, which was served all over Europe in the 19th century. Um, a friend there gave me some Rumford stew once. It tasted edible. He invented this crouton. The reason was that when people were drinking soup, they would be warm, but they wouldn't feel full. And he realized that taking stale bread and cutting it into little squares and putting it in the, in the soup uh, made the soup much more mm, palatable. You felt you'd had something. So if you have croutons on your salad or soup, it's thanks to Rumford. And he had some infrastructure innovation, poor house design. There, is a poor house designed by Rumford. Now, it looks kind of terrible, to, really, but it wasn't. It was wonderful in those days. His workhouse designs were very much along the same lines. They had lots of windows in the walls. Before then, workhouses were dark places and very unpleasant. He put in as much light as possible. And if you can see on the top, there are these chimneys all the way around. Those are Rumford chimneys over Rumford fireplaces. That's a workhouse. And here are some of his records, uh, records on the, uh, what goes on in them. The average of the description of poor for the week ending 30th of April, 1796. Employed, 74 males, 352 females infirm and incurable, you know, it was a hospice in a hospital, 172 males, 585 females. Um, th that's very telling that uh, men could do better than women in those days. Idiots, 16 male idiots, 13 female idiots and blind people, five males and 10 females. So that's the clientele he was working for. And then there is an infirmary there where there were 88 men and 300 women. And it was also a madhouse, an asylum, 15 males and 40 females. So this is a pretty big operation. So the total number of inmates there was 426 people. And then below it, he goes on with a very detailed accounting of what you need to feed all these people. You needed 186 pounds of, uh, 
uh, of bread. Um, and uh, what other, yeah, 167 gallons of buttermilk, feeding altogether 1,227 people. The, the fuel bill, all the bills are right there. This is a complete uh, accounting of how you run a workhouse like that. He, he visited all over Europe because he was a popular lecturer and he, other cities picked up on his design. So he really designed them, well, something like a modern welfare system. Here he is near the height of his career at age 44. He inv invited his daughter whom he'd never seen before to come live with him in, in Munich. She came and visited, so there's her picture. Um, he sent her back after a few weeks. And the reason was she was an American, an uncouth American and an embarrassment in the circles in which he lived. So he just returned her. Okay, for civic improvement, the English garden, the whole center of Munich, a large center was filled with um, swamps, uh, evil, evils. It was just an unpleasant, unhappy part of the city. He designed the English garden. He told the emperor he could do this at negligible cost. All he needed to do was to borrow the army for three months. So the whole thing was rebuilt in three months. And here is a picture of the English gardens in Munich from above. It's a little bit hard to see, but it, it, it's a lovely place with hills, pools, walks. It's, it's, it was a bit in the spirit of Central Park in New York, although on an even larger scale. I mean, th there is one of the pavilions in the garden. It still exists today, although it's been much reduced in size. It's called the English Garden, but in 1798, it was time to leave the country again. And for the usual reason, well, no, it wasn't a matter of spying, but people intensely disliked him. In doing all this, he had made a fortune for himself. He'd made uh, the fortune for the city too by improving its quality greatly. He was trying to compete with Paris and this was a huge boost up. So he was a tremendous benefactor, but he was, he was so unpleasant and people disliked him so much. He thought it might be just a good thing to go. So he left, he returned to England. All those years he'd been a British spy, at least on their payroll, although you know most um, uh, diplomats were spies in those days anyway, so that wasn't that serious. But he left and went back to England and he expected uh, Parliament to give him an appointment, but they refused. So he was back in England and he was penniless. Now on the way back, he stopped in Paris and, and spent a few years there. And he met the Lavoisier, Madame Lavoisier. He had met Lavoisier's widow and through her um, in intervention, he became a member of the, Fr the, the uh, French Academies of Science, which put him in the top uh, social position in Paris. She was his mistress for several years and he went to England and he needed something to do. So he founded the Royal Society. Oh, that's Lavoisier and his widow. Lavoisier was executed early in the, uh, in the Red Terror because he'd been in, uh, a landowner and taxed the poor. Madame Lavoisier was reputed to be a very intelligent and beautiful woman. And the way he's looking at her, you can see that he looked up to her. There are some rumors that she actually did some of his work. Anyway, in England, now he's at age 55, he st started a museum. 
not a normal museum. This was supposed to be a place where laborers could learn modern technologies. He knew all of this about building stoves and cooking and other technologies. And this was to be a spot where laborers would come and learn about, uh, uh, about basically his inventions. Well, he set about doing this. He wrote us in his notes, the, the battle plan for founding a, uh, a royal institution. It wasn't called that, it was just to found a new museum. And he said, the first thing you need to do is to get someone to, important to give their name to it. Then you want to have a group of friends, maybe eight or 10 wealthy friends who will be donors who will get the thing started. And they will then ask people they know for contributions. It's just what the political parties do today. And he did get a a good patron for the society. It was King George III, and that's why it became the Royal Institution. His colleagues of 12 people were people of wealth, including Cavendish, who was a great scientist uh, and also a very wealthy man. And the thing was founded within a, a year or two. He got going. Um, the goals for the institution were to educate working men, but it didn't work out that way because all the people who were involved with it liked science. They liked to hear about science. They were educated people on the upper crust and they wanted lectures on science. And their first lecturer there was Humphrey Davy. Now Davy was a great chemist, best known for designing the safety lamp, but many, many other things, identifying the elements and such. He was also a charismatic lecturer and they became a real hit in London. In fact, the first two-way street in London was the street in the Royal Institution because when Davy lectured, there was so much traffic, the whole town got tied up. So, Science was very popular then, and Davy was a great success. He hired as his assistant a uns unschooled laborer named Michael Faraday. Now Faraday became the greatest experimental physicist in G England during the uh, 19th century. So the Royal Institution really succeeded in its roles of education and also as a scientific institution. And that was all started by Rumford. But after about three years, he had to leave. And the reason was he, he was so disagreeable about the appointment of Davy. He was someone to talk to working men, not to the uh, upper crust. And um, he just quit. And in his usual fashion, he quit and went abroad. He went, um, he went back to Paris and spent some time with his mistress and they decided to get married. That turned out to be a big mistake. They got on very well while she was his mistress, but when they were married, they were totally incompatible. She liked society. She liked to go out and see people. And he really liked just to do science. Um, there's a famous anecdote where she had a carriage come with, uh, she invited friends to come with their carriages for a ride in the country. And when they got there, the gates to the chateau had been locked by Rumford. And the next morning, she went out with her maid and boiling water and poured boiling water on his favorite flowers. So it was a, a stylish spat. But Rumford then returned to England, lived in a little town. He had another mistress, with, apparently with a child, but no one knows what's come of that. And he died around uh, 1814. While he was there, Faraday had come to visit him and others. I mean, he was recognized for his achievements, but not liked by anyone. He had no friends. And that is why he's not really known now. His life would make a wonderful series for TV. 
all these episodes together. But the problem is that you don't really have a great attract, a great series where the, uh, the hero is a um, son of a bitch. So he died in relative obscurity. He's not very well known, except in his will, he left an endowment for the American Academy. So the Rumford Fund exists today and the Rumford Prize is given every few years. So his name lives on at least through that. But um, there's a moral to the story, which I think is if people don't like you, no one will remember you. So I guess that's a, a good moral to take away. You really want to be likable. So that's my story of Rumford. Thank you, Dan. I, I think all of us can say that uh, thoroughly enjoyable and an interesting guy to say the least. That was, that was very interesting. If I could just add a note on Lavoisier. You said yeah. he taxed the poor. Actually, in the, um, prior, to the new, prior to the revolution, uh, the, the French government did not have an internal revenue service. They mm -hmm. subcontracted taxation to a private company, La Femme Generale, which uh -huh. was Lavoisier's firm. He didn't tax the poor. He taxed everyone, and everybody hated him. Yeah. Yes, thanks for the corrections. He had the misfortune to be a nobleman, that's all. And regarding, uh, regarding being likable in order to be remembered, I, let's remember people like, for example, Nikola Tesla, who is still remembered to this day. And I'm sorry. Can, can you hear? Yes, uh, speak slowly because the, uh, the okay. hearing's muffled. Yeah. Let us remember uh, that in terms of being likable to be remembered, mm -hmm. Nikola Tesla was not terribly well liked by quite a number of people, and yet he's well known. Thomas Edison got into it with a lot of people, and uh, as we said, Lavoisier, uh, not well liked. Some of these guys yep. need a reputation by being a bit of a rogue. Well, whatever, whatever the knack is for being remembered, uh, Rumford lacked it. True. And for a while, so did Tesla. Mm -hmm. May I make a comment? Uh, I grew up in Munich, and I have to tell you that after 200 plus years, Rumford's name is very, very big in Munich still today. And uh -huh. particularly of interest is that actually uh, Rumford got married by the uh, Elector of Bavaria to become uh, rice crop, it means a very high nobility level, and he chose the name Rumford, which was the original name of Concord, New Hampshire. So he became then a Bavarian nobleman, in spite of all the things which you just mentioned. He probably was still more disagreeable then. So, in other words, <clears throat> particularly the English Garden is still remembered as his particular uh, creation. Yeah. Yeah, um, yes, Concord was Rumford, New Hampshire, when Rumford went there. So his choice of that name expressed some, um, I guess, regrets at having lost his country. He, he made some inquiries about returning, but no one encouraged them. I, I think it was that point when he invited his daughter to come over. I ask a question. Yeah. Uh, you keep referring to uh, how wealthy he is, but then every time he moves, how poor he is. Yeah. So in, at that point in history, mm -hmm. how did people who have a fortune or have funds uh, be able to protect them. What was the means of investing or otherwise securing 
uh, your funds so that you can do things like go from country to country. Yeah. I really don't know how the financial service works. I do know that he was very taken aback that he did not get employment when he returned to England. He expected as a matter of routine that Parliament would give him a position. I mean, a lot of uh, employment was just a matter of patronage. But he did go from uh, rags to riches to rags several times in his career. But that, may, that, that would indicate that he didn't hang on to whatever he got. Well, let's see, the first time he left, he had nothing at all. When he fled England to go to France, I think it was a, he had to. He, he was he was really in uh, uh, under danger of arrest, and he just had to get out. So he didn't have much chance to um, make financial arrangements. When he left Munich, presumably it was at his own um, at his own rate. It was his choice. And, and yeah, why he felt that um, he needed employment in England. And it may be that he did not really need employment, but he needed to do something. He was a very energetic person. He wanted a position and he had no position. So I'd speculate that that's more of a motive than, uh, than making money. When he finally retired, apparently it was to a very modest cottage in uh, southern England. Um, certainly is a very interesting individual. Uh, Rumford, Maine, I don't know whether that has anything to do with this Rumford, but uh, that's one of my favorite spots to ferry across the river on the way to, to the uh, boondocks up there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, he certainly accomplished a great deal and uh, laid the foundation for some interesting uh, activities. Yeah. He hey, made... George, I could speculate that Rumford, Maine and Rumford, New Hampshire were named after the same English guy at some point in time. Could be. Oh, well, you, know what he seem, you know what he or, seems like? He, he seems like a man, like sort of like Steve Jobs, who could see what people needed rather than waiting for the focus group to tell him what was needed. He could look at a pot and say, this drips on the floor. This isn't right. And, yeah. and fix it, you know, in a very practical way. Yeah, I mean, looking at the smoke of London as a matter of inefficiency is, takes a, a sharp outlook. I forgot to mention one of his uh, achievements. He invented steam heating of a house. The first steam heated building was the Royal Institution, and he designed the whole plumbing system. So can add that to our comforts. And he did it without blowing the place up. Mm -hmm. But it's more like inventing the crouton. Yeah. That's, that's just, you know, anybody could have done it, but he in fact did it. Well, he, he did it for a reason. He wanted he people- He figured out the reason. He figured out the reason. Yeah. Everybody knew they didn't quite get satisfied with, with soup. Everybody knew that. So that wasn't a secret, but he figured out yeah. how to fix it. I think personally that <clears throat> Thompson Longford was way ahead of his time because he did not only see the effects of poverty and the lousy situation of the army, but he looked at the original origins of the problem. And he really took all his powers and brains to relieve the culture take care of the original problem, like the poor houses, where he put the people in there and then they had to learn a trade. And by the time they had learned a trade, they got out and could start a business. So he actually looked at all the uh, really causes for the problems 
not the English garden, which was a swamp area, which was horrible, obviously, at the time. So I think it's very unusual for a man of his times to do it that way. Yes, yes. it was unusual at that time to try to put p poor people to work and teach them a trade. It was thought that poor people were not capable of learning, so they were just imprisoned. Yes. Yeah. No, he was a great social engineer. Yes. He would have been a very good American had he been on our side. <laughs> he would have been a very good American had he been on our side. <laughs> <laughs> He was on his own side. And that's what made him unpopular. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Several times. <laughs> yeah. He turned an unpopularity into an art form. <laughs> Well, we do remember that Machiavelli in The Prince said it's more important to be feared than to be loved. Well, I think he has to be quite headstrong and annoy a lot of people to get his ideas into practice and get the job done. So people like this, many times HR, all sorts of established procedures and customs. So I can see his attitude and his General position at a lot of tough time getting popular. Yeah. Yes, uh, a very utilitarian attitude. And that's common among the kind of person that he was, the kind of innovator. I expect he was a, a terribly boring dinner guest <laughs> because he <laughs> loved going on. For instance, um, in his discussion of uh, cooking and nutrition in one of his papers, he gives uh, very careful instructions for dealing with the following problem. If you have a mound-shaped pudding and you put syrup on the top, it runs off. And he proceeds to tell you exactly how to solve that problem. You take a spoon and you put a little indentation in the top and you work it around to make a little crater in the top. And then you pour the syrup in the crater and then it will run off slowly as you eat. He takes about two pages to tell you how to put syrup on pudding. So he really felt that everything he said was um, for posterity. And that was a problem for Sandy Brown because he wrote his scientific papers in many different languages, well, three or four anyway. And in fact, in most cases, they were the same paper. He would just translate it and write it in another language and add it to his list of publications. And Brown had to sift through all of these and find out which papers had original stuff in it or, what, or just repeating himself. So, those conventions weren't that well known in that in that time, but uh, Rumford never missed an opportunity to put his name on a paper. A classic academic ploy. Yep. Am I correct that he actually, with his cannon boring experiment, came up with some sort of quantitative uh, relationship between work expended and heat created? I don't know for sure whether he was the person who got this equivalent established or whether he just had the idea that he should exist. Mm -hmm. The way to look at that is that he was creative and was willing to share his knowledge in many different languages. And uh, it's as simple as that. So uh, I think he might have made a charming dinner companion. If you had patience at a dinner table, perhaps, George. I think he would be what's termed a bore, because he would be talking always about his inventions and about himself. He wouldn't be boring. He would be what's called a bore, which yeah. is overbearing.
Well, th that's what Gibbons commented on after spending uh, a trip from England to France in a boat with him. It's a perfect description of a boar. I'm surprised. I got a brother. I got a brother-in-law like that. I'm surprised he didn't invent the English muffin. No, oh, I suspect I'm like that. <laughs> no one will tell you to your face, George. I've got a wife that will. <laughs> well, in these days, publishing the same paper twice would be terrible. Actually, um, when Michelson did the famous Michelson-Morley experiment, only the first version of it was just Michelson. It was published in, in, in I think, the Philosophical Journal, which was an American scientific journal. It was also published identically in the um, Edinburgh Review, which was also a scientific journal. Um, the reason for doing that was that it took so long to go from one country to another that um, if you published it abroad, it would never get back to the United States. Um, so you can see the motivation for that is to spread the word quickly. Um, I, I've, I've seen the two versions, so I know that it happened. I've spoken to historians of science and they have not heard anything about that. The, I mean, the practice stopped with, when steamships became um, commonly in use, but it, it, it was done, it was apparently acceptable at that time. I mean, this is one of the great papers in physics, um, but it was pub duplicately published, yeah. I don't think you can be quite so hard about this business of the trans of the publishing the same paper in different languages. Um, in our time, there were translation journals. And yeah. so, uh, you know, we, we would read um, you know, very, various Soviet papers, not in the original, but in the most translation in journals that were being published. Yeah. The difference there was that there weren't any translators. If you wanted to get the word out, you had to do it yourself. Well, uh, translated articles are usually identified as that, you know, originally published as such and such. That's today. Well, that's true. Was that, was that's that true. true in the 19th century? That's in evolution, I think. Yeah. Was that still true in the 19th century, Dan? The, the publishing and translation, I've, I, I've never come across that. Publishing and translation and identifying it as a translation. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know of any translation journals. We, we used to have quite a few in this country, basically from the Russians. The, the American Institute of Physics um, it paid its way by publishing translations of the Russian papers. Well, way back, the, the scientists of Europe spoke multiple languages. Avogadro's paper is, he's from, from Italy. His paper was uh, published in uh, very uh, uh, flourishing French, uh, uh, flowery French language. Mm -hmm. I've never read his paper. Is it good well, reading? You can, I, I, read, I read his paper. Now I know enough French to fight my way out of a French restaurant. And I mm -hmm. looked at his paper and I couldn't make hide nor hair of it. And in mm -hmm. fact, it wasn't, nobody recognized its importance until about 60 years later when Ken Azzaro, uh, uh explained the paper. And mm -hmm. the French was so flowery, I couldn't understand it. And so I said, okay, well, maybe my French isn't that good. And I got the English translation. I couldn't even understand that. The, the, the sentences were so long. It was, it was like, um, like Moby Dick. The sentences were so long, you couldn't follow his thinking. And uh, even though I knew the answer, I couldn't follow it. So it was, a, it was a very strange paper. Maybe it was just translated by James Joyce. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you know, but the other thing about Avogadro's paper, I mean, with respect to that, um, in French was the international language at the time. And so it's very true. Learned every educated people all over that's the very, world. That, that's very true. And he tried to have it published by L'Academie Francaise, which was, you know, like, like, like nature uh, is now. And he got rejected. And he was published in a, a rather minor journal. Mm -hmm. Received no recognition at the time. It really, mm -hmm. I'd like to be 50 years old, you publish one of the greatest papers ever written in science, and it isn't really come to, doesn't come to the fore for another 60 years. You're long since buried and cold in the grave, and you become famous. What good is that? How well, did raise your royalties? <laughs> well, the basic concept is really very simple. <laughs> so, the ideas stuck, if, even if his arguments didn't. They weren't simple at the time if you read the paper. Mm -hmm. Well, until the Second World War, any important f physics would, was in German. And that, that changed very abruptly. Yeah. Well, that, that was already changing. Well, you lose, they lost the war. Well, but I mean, English was already, uh, American physics was moving to the fore in the 30s. Physical Review has become a must-read in Europe by the... Yeah. yeah, it's true. I mean, Michelson's papers were all in English, and some of them were very important. Um, Is that a political yeah, decision? Yeah, and the, the, the British journals you know, were very important also. No? John Mag and, and some of those. Well, didn't you scientists you have to know well. French or German to get a, a doctorate? My son did. He had to pass a test in French. He could pick either one. Oh, no. I, I was on the cusp. I mean, I had to learn, I had to know, well, I knew French and I knew enough Russian so that I could pass. But somewhere right along about the time I was in graduate school, people started saying, oh, you could learn Fortran instead of German. <laughs> yeah, I was in the same situation. Uh, we had to have either two foreign languages that we could read and, and or speak, or one foreign language and some, something they call the cognate. So it could be like Fortran or I took statistics. So yeah, we were changing at that time. The English was my best foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I knew a little French and spent a year in France and planned to, um, take advantage and, and be able to talk reasonably fluently then. But I was defeated by French bureaucracy. The French have very good bureaucracy. The place in Paris where one would go at my level was the uh, Institut Catholique. And I went there to apply and I explained, I'm, I, I know just a little, I'm really a beginner and they said, um, you'll have to show us your high school diploma. Now, you don't have high school diplomas here. I never had one. People don't use them. And uh, I, I said, uh, I, I can't supply that, but I have a letter here which might do instead. And what it was, was I happened to have in my pocket an invitation to lecture at the Collège de France. Now, the Collège de France is a very respectable institution in French. Um, and they looked at the letter and said, no. So that's why I don't speak French well. If it's any consolation to you, Dan, uh, in surveys of the French and what they would like to be as occupation, the number one occupation choice in France is to become what's called a functionnaire. Oui. <laughs> which you. is the French bureaucrat. That's the yeah. number one job in France. Yeah, no, it, it, it is, uh, I know people who, you know, say that with pride. <laughs> well, as someone once said a long time ago, the French don't care what they do actually, as long as they pronounce it properly. Properly. <laughs> well, there's this famous story when John Adams was um, uh, part of the delegation to, England, uh, this is before the revolution, 
uh, um, he introduced you know, to France. Franklin was already there and he went and he was, I mean, the goal was to try to get support for the American colonies. And he was introduced to the at Versailles at a reception, which was you did it. And uh, the, the um, foreign minister said, Sire, I would like you to meet John Adams from the United States. He does not speak French well. And the king said, don't much pity and walked away. Call from Simon. Okay. That means too bad. That means too bad. I yeah. think this is a good place to hit the pause button and thank everybody. Uh, is there any any further comments uh, for Dan on uh, on Count Rumford and his wonderful presentation? Yeah, I I'd like to ask. Uh, this may be a little bit uh, technical, but what you described you know, is, is terrific in quality. Now is standard in physics, right? Yeah. And then the science of thermodynamics. How do, can can you say in the equivalent of twenty five words or less how it got converted? Was it converted in his time? Um, I'm sorry. How how it got when, you know translated? You might say into physics language. Um, oh. Or in the scientific language, um, you know, for example, the, the cannon boring experiment is the yeah. basis of the first law of thermodynamics, right? And uh, at, at some point, some people must have actually converted that, uh, and, and in, you know, in, into uh, actual science rather than engineering. Well. Yeah, I mean, the question was, what's the nature of heat? And uh, Rumford showed it was not caloric. Uh, about uh, 20 years later, it was really pinned down by the British, principally by Jal, who really understood the conservation of energy, which you need to understand to understand heat. So th th the idea was thrashing around, but it took another generation of physicists to solve it. Incidentally, I, I do have a, a couple of page article on Rumford. If anyone's interested, just send me an email. I'll send you a copy. Dan, thank you so much. I, I think it was a, a wonderful presentation. I certainly didn't know much about uh, Rumford and uh, learned a lot. And I, and I think uh, we all benefited from your knowledge. <laughs> Thank you.